You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Um, so good morning, everybody. This is Conferences Online and Allergy. We're here at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City at the program University of Missouri, Kansas City. It is July 22nd. This is our 10 a.m. presentation in which we have Dr. Gary Sofer uh, here with us today. And then uh, at 11 o'clock, uh, Dr. Paul Dowling, our former program director here, is going to join us. Um, I'd like to do a little brief intro on, on Gary. Um, this will be, as I understand right, your first presentation with us on COLA, so welcome. Um, uh, Gary is an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics and the director of the Integrative Medicine Program at Yale School of Medicine. Completed a degree in human development at Cornell, went on and got his medical degree at Tel Aviv. Uh, following that, he completed training in pediatrics at ANI at Children's Hospital at Mont at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and then a second fellowship because he didn't have enough training, I guess, huh? Um, in integrative medicine. I'm always impressed when people go on like that. Uh, yeah, interest uh, lie in food allergies, mind, body medicine, eczema, asthma, and environmental allergies. Today, he's going to talk to us about disparities in pediatric food allergy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is really a thrill. I use these videos all throughout fellowship and, and I continue to use them now too. So it's, it's exciting to be a part of it. So I am, I'm gonna talk about disparities in pediatric food allergy, which is a very, very important subject near and dear to my heart. Um, just to go through my disclosures, I have no financial disclosures to report, but I do wanna start off by just setting, setting the pace for this today. You know, I know and we know that race, ethnicity and socioeconomic status are all different things, but I think we're at such an early stage within food allergy that they often get they'll get conflated. So I'll do my best not to, but that's really where the research is today. So let's just start off by talking about the U.S. population by race and ethnicity. This is from 2018 data. Uh, about 60% of our population, total population is white, 18% is Hispanic or Latino, 13% is black, 6% Asian, 2% uh, is multiracial, and then 1% is American Indian or Native Alaskan, and about a half percent is Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. But looking at kids, we see some, some pretty significant shifts. Um, only 50% of children in the U.S. are white, and then 25% are Hispanic or Latino, 14% are black, 5% uh, are Asian, 4% are multiracial, and then American Indian, Native Alaskan are stable at 1%, as well as Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander at 0.5%. I want you to just ask yourself, I'm not gonna shout out to anyone in particular, but ask yourself, what is the federal poverty line right now? And up here are, are two answers hidden in the multiple choice, both individual and for a family of four. And just think to yourself for a second what you think that number to be. Okay, hopefully you thought of something yourself, you can Google it. So how do we define poverty in the US? For an individual, it's about $13,590. Um, and then for a family four, and we're really thinking about families here because we're gonna talk about pediatric food allergy, um, you're considered below the federal poverty line if your pre-tax income is less than $27,705. Uh, $27, so that, sorry, that's a typo. Um, I wanna make clear some definitions because I think you know, vernacularly, we, we get these mixed up, but they're pretty well defined. So you are poor if your income is below the federal poverty line. You are considered near poor if your income is between 100 to about 200 percent of the federal poverty line. And both groups, poor and near poor, are considered low income. So that's anybody below the 200 percent of the federal poverty line. So that for a family of four is about 
16% of children in the United States, so that's 11.6 million children, are living in poverty. They're living below the federal poverty line. It's 11.6 million children. And while this talk is going out nationally, because it's in Kansas City, Missouri, I figured I would point out the data from you guys. So 50% of your patient population is low income and 22.6% is below the federal poverty line. What's really important to note is all these numbers are pre-COVID. And so we don't know what the pandemic has done to poverty. We're starting to get ideas of it now. Things are obviously shifting, things are moving. Obviously inflation has been an issue, but keep in mind that these numbers are pre-COVID. So what is the current federal minimum wage? So the current federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. So if you work 40 hours a week at that wage, how much do you think you'll make in a year? This is usually when I'm giving this talk in person and people start pulling out their calculators, but you can just guess. If the minimum wage was increased to $15 an hour, how much will you make in a year, right? Everybody talks about $15 an hour as, as the best mark and the best move forward. So current minimum wage in the US is $7.25 an hour. At that minimum wage, if you work 40 hours a week, you will make $15,000. Again, federal poverty line for a family of four is $27,750. If the minimum wage is increased to $15 an hour, you would only make $31,200 an hour. So still very, very close, still living in that near poor category. And so, there's so many determinants of health, and I touched upon this really at the beginning of this conversation, and I'm going to do my best not to conflate race, ethnicity, and slow, low socioeconomic status. But again, given the infancy and really the lack of granularity in this research, it's, it's hard to avoid it. So this chart is all over the place. It's really nice if you spend time with it, but it gives you an idea of how complex this issue is. Um, and we also know that social and structural determinants of health really don't live in silos and they are overlapping. And so let's talk about that for a couple of seconds. So children of color are more likely than white children to experience poverty. Black and Hispanic children make up about 47% of our nation's impoverished children. I think we also need to be doing more to talk about our indigenous populations, which I don't think we talk about enough, and I'll bring that up at a couple points in this conversation. They only make up 2% of our total population, but they make up 20% of our population in poverty. This is a really nice chart. The data is really, really old, but it does a really nice job of explaining the complexities, but also adding some clarification. So on the y-axis, they're looking at children, percentage children who are less than 17 years old in less than very good health. And then they categorize it into racial groups of so black non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and white non-Hispanic. And then they can categorize it into income levels. Ultimately, what we see is that Black and Hispanic children are disproportionately affected in their out overall health in every category. And so where are we specifically with food allergy? So a quick PubMed search really shows what, what the trajectory has been, what we're looking at. The first paper was really published in 1982. And overall, there's been a pretty poor trend except in 2020 in the wake of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, we did see a really nice bump, but still not where we need to be. As of 2022, there are 17 published papers this year on the subject. And just comparing that to asthma, where the first paper was published in 1963, you see a really nice trend overall across the years. Um, and there's 128 
papers published this year. So we can be doing a better job and we're starting to do a better job. So in 2021, Quad AI work group reports were released, one on food insecurity in a food allergic population. The other one is on health disparities in allergic and immunologic conditions in racial and ethnic underserved populations. All three of our major journals released special issues this year. My initial presentation that I developed on this culminated in, in a publication that you're all more than welcome to take a peek at and read. We'll cover a lot of what's in there today though. So let's dive in. Let's start off with prevalence and trends within food allergy, pediatric food allergy. And the first time anybody really noticed that there was a difference here was in 2002 when a group out of Mount Sinai started doing a random digital dial survey, just looking at the prevalence of seafood allergy. And what they noticed was there was a significant difference between the white population and the black population that was fairly impressive. It was the first time this was described. This eventually led to lots of bigger questions. And what we now see is national surveys asking questions like CDC questionnaires like NHIS, NHANES, NC, NSCH. We've seen large birth co cohorts like the WHEEL study or the Children's Health Study out of Boston. And ongoing um, is something like the Ford study, which we'll talk about in a second, um, but probably some of the most exciting data to come out on this issue alone. We also have the FAIR registry, and we always encourage all of our patients to register with the FAIR registry. And the problem is there's lots of heterogeneity in all of these works regarding diagnosis, ages, data collection, et cetera. And the biggest problem with all of them is really none of these, none of the prevalence data is determined by oral food challenges, which we know to be the gold standard of determining whether there's a food allergy or not. Just a quick word on the forward study because this is probably the most active and actively published um, cohort coming out right now. And again, some of the most exciting data. Forward stands for food allergy outcomes related to white and African American racial differences. It's out of Chicago, Cincinnati, and DC, and they recruited 950 black, Hispanic, and white children up to the age of 12. I bolded Hispanic because it's obviously not in the forward name. Um, and they're doing data collection using electronic health record linkages. They're taking biospecimens and they're doing online surveys. So a lot of good data coming out already, a lot of really great data anticipated in the future. So after Mount Sinai found out that information, that led to a question in the NHIS, the National Health Interview Survey in 2008. And they really just asked a very simple question, which was, does your child have a food allergy? And they simply removed it if there was a recent consumption or not. That was the first time it was asked, but now we've gotten a lot better out of it. So I think the most common accepted number um, based on Rushi Gupta's data is that 7.6% of children have what is determined to be a convincing food allergy in the United States. That makes two per classroom. And, you know, just if anybody's curious, the way they established convincing was one stringent symptom during a child's most severe reaction to a given food. And the stringent symptoms are in bold or italicized. There's a little bit of discrepancy between that and what parents or caregivers believe to be an allergy. So even though 7.6% of children have a convincing food allergy, 11.4% of caregivers report an allergy. What's even worse is only 4.7% of these are physician diagnosed. They also found that 40% are allergic to multiple foods and 42% experience severe reactions. Now we have to reconcile this with Medicaid data, which shows completely different numbers. So that looks at 23 million children and found that food allergy rates are only 0.6%, again, compared to that 7.6% we mentioned before. This is clearly not the number. And so you wonder, is this because of underdiagnosis or undercoding? But clearly the number is, is 
much higher than that. So looking at overall pediatric food allergy by race and ethnicity, Asian American children make up 3.2% of the population where they make 2.8% of children with food allergy. African American children make up 13.2% of the population but make up 15.4% of the population with food allergy. White non-Hispanic children make up 52.8% of the population while they make up 48.3% of the food allergy population. Hispanic children make up 24.1%, um, whereas they make 26.5% of the food allergy population. And then multiracial or other 6.6% of the total population and make up 7.1% of the food allergy population. Now this paper didn't mention native or indigenous children in the US. And again, we need more insight on that data because how at risk they truly are. So what do we know about trends and shift of food allergies? Overall, we know that food allergy is increasing and it's increasing about 1.2% per decade. But looking at different racial groups, there's major, major differences. So white children, that changes about one point is 1%. Hispanic children, 1.2%, but in black children, it's 2.1%. It's a pretty significant increase. I do just want to say a word about sensitization versus allergy, because we really do know that a sensitization doesn't necessarily equate into an allergy. Um, N. Haynes looked at specific IgE levels and only used a cutoff of 0 0.35. Um, which we know is not predictive necessarily. Um, and non-Hispanic, but comparing groups, black children had an 8.4% chance of being sensitized, but only a 39 to 4.6% chance of truly being allergic or having a self-reported food allergy. With Hispanic children, it was 4.2% were sensitized, 25 to 3% reported an allergy, and with white children, 2.5% had sensitization, but only but 4.3% had a food allergy described. So very interesting stuff here, important to figure out. With the wheels cohort out of Detroit that we mentioned at age three, they found differences in sensitization across different racial groups, but they actually found similarities in clinical reactions. Again, we have a lot more to figure out with this. I'm going to take a sip of my water. So as we get more specific, we get better ideas. We have more freedom to talk about specific foods and differences in specific foods. So again, this was first described in 2002 out of the group Sinai that I mentioned before. Then in 2009, another paper came out that found that non-Hispanic black children had significantly higher proportion of sensitization to shrimp, milk, and egg than non-Hispanic white children. Later in 2012, again, this was out of the group in Sinai, found that low-income minority children in East Harlem specifically, that black children had higher rates of peanut, shellfish, and tree nut allergies than Hispanic and multiracial children. I think the best study thus far um, is came out in 2017. This was a retrospective cohort um, looking at two urban tertiary care centers in the US. And what they found was peanut, egg, and milk was similar among black, Hispanic, and white children. African-American children had significantly higher rates of allergy to wheat, soy, corn, fish, and shellfish compared to white children. Hispanic children had significantly higher rates of allergy to corn, fish, and shellfish. White children had higher rates of tree nut allergies. And then shellfish, corn, and fish were significantly higher in Hispanic and African American children. And I highlight the shellfish and fish for a very specific reason. We know that those impoverished, especially in urban areas, have a higher dust mite and cockroach burden. And we also know that fish and shellfish contain tropomyosin. And so the question is, is, is are, these, are these allergies or sensitizations 
really secondary to this tropomyosin cross-reactivity and not any sort of genetic element. Children with shellfish allergy were more likely to have severe asthma, which again we know is associated with dust mite and cockroach burdens. And other food allergies were actually not associated with the diagnosis of asthma. So moving on to acute management. So from 2008 to 2012, we see increases in ED visits and hospitalizations across the board amongst all groups. But in terms of average annual percent change, that change had been greatest within the Hispanic population. With regards to ED visits specifically, Black and Hispanic children have higher number of ED visits for food allergy reactions, both in their lifetime and in the past 12 months. With regards to ER visits and hospitalizations, children whose families are making over $100,000 a year have almost half the amounts of visits and hospitalizations as those making less than $50,000 a year. Children in the lowest household income stratum, so making less than $50,000 a year, actually incur two and a half times the ED and hospitalization costs as a result of their food allergy. What do we know about anaphylaxis? So this fatal anaphylaxis data is looking at adults and not pediatrics, but to me, it's probably the most important thing you'll see all day because it shows the real life impact of disparities. Black females are at a twofold risk of food allergy related anaphylaxis and fatal anaphylaxis, and black males are at a threefold risk. Looking at anaphylaxis overall in children, black and Hispanic children have a significantly higher rates of food allergy associated anaphylaxis. What about epinephrine prescription and administration? So looking at Massachusetts school, again, this is in 2005, they found that white students were more likely to have been dispensed epinephrine than non-white students. Houston schools in 2014 found that six times more injectors in low socioeconomic schools than were in, than in low, so in not, sorry, six times more injectors were found in non-low socioeconomic schools than in low. Low socioeconomic schools and limited English proficiency was associated with a decrease in epinephrine in the school. In New York City, Medicaid enrolled children were less likely to receive epinephrine before the arrival to the ED. And then school preparedness, how, you know, this is, this is such a frequent conversation is how prepared are schools for anaphylaxis? What are they doing in terms of policy? So in Illinois, what they found was disproportionate impact on low income rural and minority children. I think what's so important about this study, just as an aside, is the fact that they focused on rural children. Most of the data that we have right now is really looking at urban children. And I, we do need to be focusing more on our rural populations. Um, when they surveyed the nurses and the aides in these schools, rural schools are least likely to have an undesignated epinephrine, so any stock epinephrine or a written plan or protocol. High socioeconomic status schools were six times more likely to have epinephrine available, so that's very similar to that Houston data that I mentioned in the previous slide. With regards to school policy, so this is just looking at Massachusetts. It was published in 2020, but the data actually comes from 2010. Um, 2011. Schools with peanut free tables had higher proportions of low income and minority students. Schools banning peanut altogether had a higher proportion of minority students. And just talking about bullying, because I think, you know, this doesn't fit anywhere perfectly, but I think bullying is such an important conversation that we need to be having more with our food allergic kids. 20% of school aged children are bullied for food allergies. That's a really, really high number. There's actually no substantial racial differences for food allergy specific bullying, although 
uh, white children over the age of 10 did report some higher levels of, of food allergy related bullying, but black children experienced two times the amount of bullying overall for non food allergy related issues. And parents, parents too. So 17 and a half percent of parents report that they were teased or bullied for their child's food allergies. Bullying is actually lower in peanut free schools. That's as much as we know about it right now. So evaluation, long-term follow-up, and, and other issues that are important to bring up. So initial evaluation and follow-up. So what happens at that initial evaluation? African-American children had significantly lower rates of completing a skin prick test or a specific IgE testing than white and Latino children after their initial appointment. Looking at food allergy patients on Medicaid, 18% of food allergy patients, only 18% have seen an allergist, yet 21% of them have visited the ER. Hispanic ethnicity and living in high poverty counties were associated with lower subsequent allergy visits and epinephrine prescription refills. More on initial evaluation and follow-up. So black Asian and Hispanic children have higher prevalence of food allergy, but lower odds of physician diagnosis. So that was sort of a broad way of looking at it, but getting a little bit more granular about it, Black and Hispanic children have similar initial evaluation or referral rates, but the follow-up is worse. So for white children, the average duration of a follow-up is about 3.2 years. For Black children, it's 2.3 years. And for Hispanic children, it's 2.2 years. And we know that shorter follow-up negatively affects food allergy outcomes. You see increased rates of anaphylaxis and increased rates of fatality. So some information on food introduction. Again, this comes from the forward data, so pretty new and fresh. Peanut milk and egg intro is delayed among, more delayed among black children versus white children. White children have uh, increased rates of introduction of peanut and milk below the age of six months. There's actually no differences in egg introduction, but, and this is the most important part of the slide, is 89% of children, black children with a peanut allergy were not introduced to peanuts by one years old versus 67% of white children with peanut allergy. So we need to be pushing our early introduction in these children. And what about spending? So what are people spending on allergy allergists? For the white population, it's about $310. For African-American, it's $157. For Hispanic population, it's $127. And for Asian population, $100. If you look at it based on income, visits are lower in households making less than $50,000 a year. And out-of-pocket medication spending was also lower among households earning $50,000 a year. Out-of-pocket costs. So it's, it's a crazy number, but $1.7 billion are spent on specialty diets every year. And this varies by income. Not surprisingly, it's much less amongst those making less than $100,000 a year but it also varies by ethnicity. Now, when they looked at this, it wasn't controlled for income, so obviously have a little bit of skepticism. White children spend about $1,200 a year on special diets, whereas African-American children, $177 a year, Hispanic children, $219, and Asian children, $148. So that's not a typo, that's, that's a pretty impressive difference. Just talking about SNAP, and, and um, EBT cards, the policies really don't consider unique food needs increased um, that, that our food allergy population really needs. So if you compare peanut butter versus like the, the sun butter that, that many of our patients replace peanut butter with, peanut butter can cost $1.82, whereas sunflower spread might cost $7.50. 
differences in milk. So a gallon of milk, I don't know what it is right now. God, it's probably way higher. Um, but a gallon of milk is about, if it's $4.46, soy milk is $6 and almond milk is $8. And, you know, in my clinic, we're recommending ripple milk, which I think is even more than both of these. Talking about food insecurity. So this is this is a major, major issue among our food allergy pa patients. So who's at the greatest risk? So any household with children is at risk for food insecurity. Households that include any children under the age of six households that are headed by a single parent or caregiver, black and Latino households specifically, households with income under 185% of the federal poverty line. There are 60,000 food pantries and soup kitchens in this country and only four of them exclusively stock allergen-free foods consistently. And during the pandemic, only two of those were actually operational. 21% of children with food allergy experience food insecurity. And so we need to be asking our patients more about this. We need to be considering this more while we're interacting with our patients day to day. White food allergy caregivers, so 88% were more likely to report access to food than black food allergy caregivers. And again, that's out of the, the newer forward data. So pre-COVID, one in seven children lived in a household experiencing food insecurity. During the pandemic, that number dramatically shifted to one in four. I don't know where it is now, but it shows how fragile that number is and how quickly it can change in our patient population. So I was very excited to see this work group report on food insecurity. And what they did was a survey with a 6.3% completion rate. They found that, and they, you know, they surveyed allergists about food insecurity. 71.2% of the respondents were unaware of whether their food allergy, their patients with food allergies faced in food insecurity in the past six months. Only about 15% reported screening patients and um, 10% reported screening all patients. I have to go back and look that, I apologize. They gave a really nice list of recommendations that I'll let you read on your own time, but obviously we need to see changes in this. So I love this study and, and this, is, this is out of children's mercy. So if Dr. Jones is here, a special shout out because I, I really love this paper because it exemplified what a simple, elegant study can do and, and the impact that it can really have on understanding these issues. And what they did was they reviewed 135 trials of food allergy immunotherapy and found that only 12% of the trials reported racial demographics. Fortunately, 13 out of 16 conducted in the US did, but still that leaves three that did not. And what they found was that 81% of these trials were made up of white or Caucasian children. 7.6% were Asian, 6.6% um, were multiracial, only 2.8% were Black or African American, 1.2% Hispanic or Latino, and less than 1% were Native American or Pacific Islander. Going back to what we know about our prevalence data, this is grossly unrepresentative of what our populations really look like. And what about just oral immunotherapy awareness? So households earning over $100,000 or with a college degree each had approximately double the odds of reporting awareness of oral immunotherapy as a management strategy. Hispanic, Black, or Asian ethnicity were less likely to report any awareness of OIT, but they were, that was not statistically significant. So looking forward, where do we go from here? So this was a really nice qualitative study out of the group in Northwestern, looking at 10 Medicaid-insured families 
um, and did semi-structured interviews to get an idea of what the major barriers were for a food allergic patient on Medicaid. And they identified three major groups. The first was limited primary caregiver knowledge, a lot of confusion and uncertainty, really a faulty perception of risk. There was poor inter-caregiver management. Family members or other people taking care of the children didn't know how to manage an allergic reaction. They didn't understand what severity was. Um, and then there was insecure access to allergen-free foods, which we discussed before. So in our review, we identified five major domains within food allergy management that need to be tackled and focus on. Uh, the first being food allergy awareness, increasing community education in schools and pediatric health care providers, prevention, early introduction, getting, you know, getting these populations more access to early introduction, diagnosis, prevalence and physician diagnosis, Acute management, we need greater access to epinephrine auto-injectors, we need schools that are more prepared and have better policies, um, and we need to decrease the need for emergency department utilization um, by greater education, really getting in front of this acute management issue and educating our families. With regards to long-term management, we all know we need greater access to subspecialty care, we need greater access to available therapies for everyone, greater access to allergen free foods um, for food insecure patients and greater education for people taking care of these kids. And we identified really where future interventions should go and I'll, I'll you know, I'll really allow you to read this yourself. Um, Improving food allergy education and school preparedness, again, expanding access to specialty care, which we discussed, facilitating access to allergen free foods, supporting research in health disparities. And then the final topic we'll get into right now, which is addressing allergy immunology workforce diversity. So when we look at 2020 applicant versus matched data, zero applicants from our Native American population. In the Asian population, 34% of applicants were Asian and 39% of those who matched were Asian. Within the Black or African American population, it was about even those who applied matched. But in our Hispanic population, almost 8% made up the applicant pool, but only 3.3% actually matched. Native American, uh, with Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, the applicants were only half a percent and nobody matched. Then with our white population, 45% made up the applicant pool and 46.7% matched. And then the other group was about even. And how do we look overall? Asian population makes up 21% of allergists. Black and African Americans make up only 2.8% of allergists. American Indians or Alaskan Natives make up less than 1%, Hispanic 4%, Native Hawaiians make up less than a percent, multi multiracial non-Hispanic make up less than 1%, and then our white percent, our white population makes up about 52%. So again, very disproportionate to to our U.S. population, but also disproportionate to our patient population. So I'm ending a little bit earlier. I think I spoke a little faster than I usually do, but I just want to point out this movie because this is really what clued me into this conversation. Uh, this is a movie called Black Men in White Coats. It's available online. I would suggest everybody just take some time to, to watch it and, and learn from it. So that concludes my talk. I really appreciate everybody's time. I think we have a very, very long and far way to go with this conversation, um, but I think we're on the right trajectory, hopefully. Here are my references, and I think that's, that's all. All right, thanks, right, Dr. Thanks, Sof, for that. That was very enlightening. Very enlightening. Um, 
I'm going to open this up to questions in a minute here, but you know, when, when I heard about the opportunity um, of you to be able to get this talk, I was excited about it. And then as I sit through this and I just got all these ideas going through my head of like projects we can work on with our fellows or with myself and whether it's abstract post or QI research, there's just a whole world of opportunity for us to explore in our area. Um, so anyway, I, I appreciate uh, uh, the little boost of, of energy uh, to, to look for the um, some better answers. Like with any problem, being aware of the problem is the first step. That's what we started with today, right? And then the next step is what we do with it in our own organizations, in our own cities. So anyway, I, I really appreciate what you just did for us. Um, I want to open this up to, to the audience for questions now, if we could. Uh, hi, Dr. Sofer. Um, my name is Jody. I'm actually a nurse practitioner with the Children's Mercy Group, and I was one of the authors on the Food and Security Work Group report. Um, I'm just curious, um, from your own personal experience, are, are you guys routinely screening, and then when you have positives, what is your practice doing with them? You know, I'm not, and it's because I don't have a path forward, and so I want to understand a path forward before I can start screening. And that seems a little bit backwards, but it's probably my own personal insecurity in managing these patients um, and wanting to do better. But, you know, it's, it, I, I'm not, I'm not yet. And I need to be, but I need to have an answer of what to do with these patients when this becomes an issue. I, I what I will tell you is what I've done in the background is I've communicated with social work to see if there are any steps forward that we could be doing and providing. I've been speaking to local food pantries and, and food services to see what their access to care has been, but but we're not there yet. And, and we need greater infrastructure for this really to happen. Yeah, I would agree. And I feel like that's the huge problem is we don't have pantries that are willing to store these special foods and really like take a partnership with us. I think for me, the, the biggest change that needs to happen is on a legislative level, whereas EBT and SNAP needs to be recognizing that there's significant differences in spending for kids with food allergies and kids with without food allergies and, and what they're given needs to reflect that. And then you know, I think other legislative things that need to happen is starting to consider, you know, I mean, this is a term from my, my integrative world, but food as medicine, you know, because these children really do need adequate nutrition and they're relying on less nutritious foods to, to get their to get their caloric intake um, that that we be providing. You know, one of my one of my big pieces in integrative medicine and talking about food allergy is how nutritious so many of the common allergenic foods are. I mean, you talk about fish and nuts and all these other things that are cheap, affordable, really healthy foods. Um, so it really, to me, it really needs to happen on a much larger legislative level for us to see meaningful change. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tal. I'm one of the new first year fellows at Children's Mercy. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk just because I think it's really interesting in learning about like different healthcare disparities and like how they relate to different subs like parts within the allergy immunology world. Um, but something that I thought was interesting, as you mentioned it, was kind of looking at the different rates of anaphylaxis based off of different ethnic groups. But within that, it made me think a little bit more about just like healthcare literacy and also reading level because, you know, as a part of our instructions, when we tell parents, you know, when we've identified based off of skin testing, you know, start reading the ingredients. But then I remember that, you know, the reading level where I trained in Louisiana was very, very low. But then I don't necessarily screen my parents to see, like, if they can read. And I kind of wonder if that ties into, like, accidental ingestions or if they're having to go to the ER more frequently simply because, you know, we didn't ask them if they're able to even read like labels. So do you have that as a part of your screening practice or like when these patients come in or what do you do? So what we what we do is we we run it through certain groups that are university that will make sure that it's at an adequate reading level. 
and then we will also offer it in right now most of our handouts are both in Ang english and and spanish to to support those families but again it's it's not enough and it's one of these issues that it's not the only issue there are just so many social determinants of health that overlap that we have to you know that we have to look at it both globally and we have to look at it very specifically so that's what we're doing right now is is we're trying to provide very basic information in the handouts but we're also trying to provide different languages in the handouts because that's a big issue for us as well good question that sounds like a project for you by the way Definitely. Our, our institution with the majority of our forms that go out do also have a, a required, uh, I think it's like fourth grade um, yeah. reading ability here. Um, but obviously we all come up with our own little stuff. We type in our um, information that we give to our parents and not all of it gets done if it's not an official form. So a challenge. I, I did want to comment too, um, is we're looking at, you know, poverty level, um, the commonality or how prevalent uh, food allergies are in a lot of our um, underserved populations. You know, if if you, it's a, a question not to be answered um, by the group, but, you know, anybody have an idea what SNAP or EBT um, total sum of money per month is for our, our patients? You know, how much are they getting to help with those so-called food stamps? Um, in, in the Kansas City area, it's about $100 to $150 per month, okay? Um, and during the the actually um, the whole pandemic, they, they did increase that a little bit, but now it's gone back to the standard rates. Um, it's all based on what limited income one might be able to earn. But the the reality, who can live on a hundred dollars a month for eating? Now add a food allergy into it. Go to the store. Try not try to avoid just two simple proteins, milk and egg, and you, you'll see how impossible that is. Now go to a, a, a food bank. We're, we're lucky in Kansas City. We do have some access to some decent food banks. And Jody was very instrumental in getting um, a lot of our food insecurity screening going in connections to programs. Um, but anyway, the bottom line, it, you can't do it based on the money that's provided. Um, another issue I wanted to throw out there, too, is access, um, which may relate to the increased ED visits, hospitalizations, et cetera, and, and some of the um, minority populations or the underserved areas. Um, if you look at the typical, and I can speak mainly of Kansas City, but private practice allergists in, in general don't see Medicaid, which is I'm in a pediatric institution, that's 51% of my population, okay? So we are getting all the patients here. We're not the easiest access. Any large academic center is not going to be because we're downtown and parking and transportation, all those issues. So just getting to us is hard and they don't have a choice of going out in, their, in the other area. You don't see private allergists living downtown and practicing downtown in general here. That's the academic world. So their access is, is limited to their their food financial status is limited. So yeah, I can see why they're going to have the higher emergency room visits and um, the diagnosis problems and the management problems too. There's so many social determinants, so many barriers to getting that done. But that doesn't mean we we can't start changing that. For sure. And, you know, it's I would argue that even the the urban poor probably have better access than the rural poor. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I agree. We we you know in Kansas City we've got a couple uh, three major cities in, in all of Kansas. We would put on the Kansas and Missouri side. Um, I'm more familiar on the Kansas and um, at, you know a lot of our patients literally drive three to four hours to get here. Um, telemedicine has changed that a little bit. There are some limitations with that too. But um, yeah, access is, is terribly difficult. Probably 90% of our state on the Kansas side doesn't have access to analogies. Our second biggest city, I believe, uh, would be Wichita, and they have zero allergies currently in, on the Kansas side. So. All right, do we have any more questions or comments from the, the group? All right. Um, so, Gary, I do appreciate you doing this today. Great conversation, great presentation. I'm, I'm hoping I can reach out and uh, have you maybe visit with us on COLA for a little integrative medicine. I 
traditionally have given the complementary and alternative medicine talk. Mine's more from a, a reading perspective, not a practice side. So I think uh, your expertise would help on that. So um, you, would, you, you'll, you'll be getting an email from me someday. I hope you can participate on that. I'd, I'd, love, too. I'd love it. And thank you all for, for everything you guys are doing with this, because it, it really did have a big impact on my education. So I appreciate we're, it. We're, we're glad to hear that. Uh, Paul Dowling just sa signed on and Paul, along with Jay Portnoy, were the two instrumental ones in making COLA all come to be. So uh, it's, it's good to have Paul here to, to, well, to, to see the, that we're carrying sure. forward. Yeah. Thank you all again. Thank you so much for listening. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. We appreciate you. Bye. Bye.